I guess this is the first of two family affairs for the Presidential Lecture Series. I mentioned my brother's coming next week. Um, tonight we have the Cannons. I'll start with uh, the elder, Lou Cannon, is a Dole Institute favorite, not just because he wrote what people of every political persuasion refer to as the definitive biography of Ronald Reagan. That would be for the book President Reagan, The Role of a Lifetime, or because his other excellent books on the Rodney King affair and the LA riots, earlier books on Reagan, including the very well-read uh, Reagan from 1982. It's because he did such a great job here as a presidential lecture series guest in 2005, when he did, I believe, two separate events while he was suffering from a terrible, terrible head cold. Uh, he was so gracious to come, and one of the many reasons we wanted to have him back. The reason his Reagan biographies are so good, I am convinced, is that he covered the man for 36 years, uh, for the San Jose Mercury News, for Ritter Publications, and later for the Washington Post, where I uh, grew up reading his coverage of the Reagan White House and his terrific syndicated column for the Post. Look at the other Reagan biographies. Uh, Edmund, Mor Edmund Morris is the official Reagan biographer. He had special access to all of these papers that uh, the First Lady gave him. Um, he's hand-picked, and, and yet he doesn't seem to get the man as much as uh, Lou Cannon did. Richard Reeves, who's a wonderful presidential biographer and a, and a great author, and I believe a Kansas City native, just had a hard time uh, explaining Reagan's thought process, how he, w how he operated as a leader the way that Lou Cannon does. Some other things. He has been a uh, the Rasnick Distinguished Lecturer in the History Department at UC Santa Barbara, which is just like KU, except it's actually on the beach, and a journalist in residence at the Annenberg School of Communications at USC. Carl M. Cannon, the son of Lou Cannon, is a reporter's reporter. While on vacation in San Francisco in 1989 to see the Bay Area World Series between the A's and the Giants, he found himself covering the Loma Prieta earthquake instead of relaxing at a game. He was a member of the San Jose Mercury news staff that won a Pulitzer for covering the quake. After working for five other newspapers that I could count, he landed in 1988 at National Journal, a paper not nearly as well known outside the Beltway as it should be. It's nonpartisan, the stories are in-depth, and important and smart people read it, largely because of the excellent reporting of reporters like Carl Cannon. He has spent so many years, uh, men, spent many years as a White House correspondent and covered every presidential campaign and presidential convention since 1984. For his work, he's been awarded the Gerald R. Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency, and in 2006, the Aldo Beckman Award for Excellence in Political Reporting. He also authored the presidency column for the late lamented magazine George, um, published by John John Kennedy. I should also mention his excellent crime and police reporting. In California, his reporting on a 1937 L.A. murder held secure a pardon based on innocence for a wrongly convicted man. How many of us can say we helped free a wrongly convicted man from jail? As an author, he is well on his way towards catching up with his dad. He co-authored Boy, Boy Genius, a biography of the White House aide Karl Rove, and a book called The Pursuit of Happiness in Times of War, an extremely thoughtful book that explores how leaders have used the language of our greatest founding document, the Declaration of Independence in Times of Crisis. He has very recently also taken on a job as uh, the Washington Bureau Chief for Reader's Digest, so hopefully a lot more people will read him. Please let me bring onto the stage Lou Cannon and Carl Cannon. What gave the two of you the idea to write this, this book that we'll be talking about tonight, Reagan's Disciple, George W. Bush's Troubled Quest for a Presidential Legacy, and how'd you actually do the writing? Well, I'll, I'll do the first part, okay. and then you do the second. <laughs> all right. uh, first of all, I want to thank Jonathan Earl. Uh, uh, and hearing him give the introduction, my view is, why doesn't he just stay out here and talk about us? <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll go somewhere and that. have a glass of wine. <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, uh, Carl and I were both uh, Hoover Media Fellows at, at Stanford, where we've been before. Uh, the uh, Hoover Institution has been uh, kind to us. And uh, we gave a talk there in, uh, I believe it was March of 2006, if I've got the date right. Uh, and the, we, were, we were there together, and it was unusual to have father and son there together. Uh, a, a 
as it is for us to be here tonight. And we gave a talk called A Tale of Two Presidents, uh, which uh, we, were, we were asked to do. Uh, the talk was, was about Reagan and, and George W. Bush. And the uh, audience was sort of half Hoover, which uh, tends to be conservative, and half Stanford alumni, which tends to be liberal. And both sides seemed to like the talk, so we decided to make a book out of it. Now, I think you have a sp more specific well, uh, remembrance he, of it. Well, he always eliminates this guy because we don't know his name. And <laughs> yeah. But some, some guy comes up to us, some random guy afterwards. We don't know who he was this day. And he says, that was terrific. You guys should do a book. And I said, um, I was polite enough. I said, yeah, 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 pal, where's the bar? You know, I said, I have a job. Well, he's retired. He doesn't have a job. He says, um, I'll catch up with you. I want to talk to this guy for a minute. And um, he was just some drunk off the street, but... <laughs> but he had a good idea. Apparently. And so he came up to me, and at the bar he found me. My dad does find the bar. He's not a teetotaler. And so um, he said, you know, this guy says we should do a book. I think we should do a book. And I, I don't know, you know, in journalism, if Luke Cannon says he wants to do a book with you, I don't care who you are, there's only one answer. You say, sure, you get a contract, I'll do a book with you. He had a contract in about three weeks, and it started. The more interesting thing, in a way, is, is I live in Washington. I'm covering the White House. He lives in Santa Barbara. Um, Semi-retirement. You should have such a retirement. He writes, and he's on a board, and he goes to the racetrack. He's busy. But we couldn't have done this in the old days. You know, we, you, you, we emailed chapters That's back great. and forth, and we talked on the phone, and the technology really made this possible. And not just the, the technology of, of research, and Jonathan knows this, historical figures. If you want to know anything that Lincoln ever said, ever, in writing, it's in the National Archives. Well, you can get it at your home computer. That's why there's all these books about the Founding Fathers, because you don't have to go to 17 different archives or libraries, you can do a lot of that right at your desktop. And so we were able to do a lot of research and also to pass chapters back and forth. You didn't ask this, but I'll, let me just add this. At the beginning, there's a thing. We, we tend to see things similarly politically and journalistically because we're, well, because I'm like him, but, <laughs> but, but because we're not ideologues. We don't, we're not partisan. Yeah, that's, that's good. And we, so we, we, we tend to, we don't always have the same perception, but we, we go to the facts, and that's kind of how we do it. But still, we had different writing styles. And at the very beginning, the first chapter, the prologue, which I turned in, and he hated, and, and the first chapter that he wrote. But anyway, it's funny. We passed these things back and forth, and by the end of it, it was just seamless. The last five chapters, we wrote without much discussion. He did one, I did one, he did one. The book came out. There's five chapters. and There's ten chapters in the book. He wrote ten, five, I wrote five. Yeah. And I'll tell you something you don't know. Uh, my mom called, and my dad and mom have been divorced for a long time, but she called from Florida the other day, and she'd read the book, and she said, I can't believe this. She said, I know stuff he had to write, and I know the part you had to write, and I've seen, but it sounds like one voice. How did you do this? And I didn't have an answer that's, for it. No, that's remarkable. I don't really know how we did it, but apparently we did do it, because she's a tough critic. And actually, just for some, from someone who doesn't know your writing styles well enough to be able to tell who wrote each chapter, they do. There's not like, oh, this chapter is one guy and this chapter is the other. Yeah. It's, very, it's very seamless. Yeah. So I, someone, you either had a good editor or you really did. I it actually yourself. wrote the chapter. Uh, uh, I, I think about this book that we wrote the entire book because we did write the book together. I actually wrote the chapter that is called Reagan's Disciple that deals with, with which the con it's it's the sort of the concession chapter in the book. That uh, if you don't like uh, George W. Bush and you're a conservative, uh, you'll you'll uh, uh, you'll like this chapter because it gives him it gives him credit again if you're of, of, of his view on the judicial appointments. He's had a more profound effect than judiciary than any president. He's nominated about two thirds of it. He's gotten two reliable conservative appointments, which. Uh, uh, neither neither his father nor 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 Reagan ever did, and we give him we give him credit on taxes again if you have that view. Now, Carl and I were on a, but it, it does sort of show. Uh, I'm obviously no George W. Bush fan, but it does sort of show that George W. Bush can't even get credit from people who agree with him. Carl and I were in the first week of this month on the uh, stage of the 
Conservative Political Action Committee uh, um, they have a convention. It's an, it's CPAC, it's called. It's an annual convention. And I, we had a sort of disastrous appearance. <laughs> uh, 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 Vice President Cheney came early and interrupted our panel, which had to then be reconvened. Uh, uh, later, we, we got stuck on the dais while he spoke. As sort of props for Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> later, 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 there's a book signing, which is this, uh, you know, now disembodied and three hours removed from the speech. And George Romney with, withdraws during this. No. Uh, Mitt Romney, sorry, I do that all the time. I knew his father. I, I, uh, uh, withdrew during the the uh, book signing, and so it wasn't a particularly auspicious. Uh, <laughs> but it came. It was a good story. Day, but during the panel, there's a guy named Al Regnery. He is the biggest conservative publisher in the country, the Regnery Publishing Company, and Al is a. Uh, although he and I disagree about about everything, he's a very good guy, and I make this point about the judiciary, and he says, "Well, he says I've got to disagree with my friend Lou on that." And his point of view is that uh, uh, who Bush really wanted to put in the Supreme Court was Harriet Myers and, uh, and Alberto, and Alberto Gonzalez. Gonzalez, and uh, only us conservatives, staunch our conservatives, <laughs> persuaded him to nominate. Uh, uh, these two, uh, uh, Roberts uh, uh, and, and Alito, which is not exactly yeah. the story of what happened. <laughs> I can't catch a break. But but but, it, but the point is, here's this guy. He, he can't catch a break from anyone. He can't get a credit credit even for when he's done what the people who uh, who think this is all important want him to do. And uh, um, Al Regnery taught me a lot that day. Well, on to one of the other uh, arguments of the book. Um, we've had one other father-son. Um, combination in the White House and when John Quincy Adams succeeded his father John Adams a lot of what he spent doing was trying to vindicate the Federalist views of, of his father who was a great founding father and who by by 1825 had really sunk in, in people's estimation why when George W. Bush is inaugurated in in, uh, in 2001 is he not trying to vindicate his father's one-term presidency the same way um, which was not a Catastrophe. I mean, he lost his reelection bid. Why do they come in the Bush, the George W. Bush administration, saying they're emulating Ronald Reagan's presidency, not George Herbert Walker Bush's? Because Ronald Reagan is the icon. He's the, he's the iconic president. He's not only the most conservative president. He's really the first uh, successful Republican president since Eisenhower, whom a lot of people thought was it wasn't a success as a Republican, but as a war hero. Uh, there's no other president. Uh, the only other president who gets reelected to a second term who is a Republican before George W. Bush is Richard Nixon. And he leaves the White House in utter disgrace. So the, the biggest thing I, 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 about Ronald Reagan, there's a lot of things about him, and I think there are a lot more important things about him than this. But the biggest thing about Ronald Reagan is he's a, he's a, he's a real success. He's a success story. You know, he gets reelected in a 49 state landslide. He's, despite Iran Contra, he leaves office. He's pers his approval ratings are in the 60s. So, uh, why wouldn't you want to emulate him? Can, can I add something to that? Mm -hmm. um, I agree with that. But, and we, we write about that. But there's, as I sit here, there's something else. And that is, you know, winning is everything. Vince Lombardi said. It's true in politics, too. Um, George W. Bush. George H. W. Bush is judged a failure. Why? Because he didn't win re-election. That's the only reason. He, the revisionism of him is already starting. He already, oh, it's going to happen. He already looks better than he looked. And, and, and losing the re-election then is supposed to mean you weren't a good president. But that doesn't mean, you know, then Churchill wouldn't have been good. I mean, th right. that doesn't take you very far. Now, you can people have views about Jimmy Carter that he was a failure president, and they point to things. But I would argue that it's not because he didn't win re-election. And the Clinton people were very aware of this. Every modern pres person with presidential ambitions is aware of it. Bush, uh, the current President Bush was aware of it. In after Bill Clinton was elected, I was in Little Rock, and I was talking to uh, Mickey Cantor, who was an old source of yours from California. And he was in the transition. And they were talking how they're going to carry California. You're talking about in 96. Wow. He hasn't taken the oath of office yet. This is 1992. And I said to George Stephanopoulos, that's, that's crazy. That's terrible. 
And he said, it's not our fault, it's your fault. The press will judge a guy a failure if he's not being reelected. And that taught me something. And so, in another sense, Bush is, this Bush was pressed from the very start to distance himself from a father in a way that we don't examine this in the book, and this has occurred to me later, but it's, it's in a way, not his fault. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to take people in the audience through some of the arguments in the early part of the book, um, which policies of the Bush administration, especially early on, were an attempt to, to carry over the Reagan, the Reagan years? And in what ways did they stray? Taxes starts with that. Yeah. Uh, when Bush ran for office in 2000, he basically had a, a minimalist platform. Um, he was going to cut taxes. His rationale for that changed, um, which is interesting. And I, I don't mean his prince. I mean he had a visceral reaction against taxes. But first of all, he said that um, there was a surplus from the last year of the Clinton administration. Oh, yeah. There was a surplus, and um, the Democrats, Clinton people said it was their responsibility. The Gingrich people in Congress said they did it. Well, both of them did it. But there was a surplus. And Bush said practically as a moral, as a proposition that if you leave that money in Washington, it will be spent. That was a very kind of Reagan formulation. But it's the old Republican yeah. formulation of, of the uh, the taxes are, are your money. Yeah. And so you're giving back, uh, you know, right. uh, your money to the, the, the people rather than spending it. Right. Like government somehow wasn't you know, sure. part of. But by the time he gets in office, of course, there's not a surplus. In fact, there's a risk. That, and so Bush has a, his second argument, line of argumentation is that it, you, it's immoral to spend more than 33%. It was that, that also was kind of Reagan-esque in a way. He never quite explained why that that was the magic number, but yeah. the number is just too high. You, a third of your taxes goes to the government. People kind of, these audience would nod, yeah, that's too much. Yeah. And then when he got, then then he takes the oath off a couple months later, there's a recession. And now his line of argumentation is this will help spur spending. This will make the recession less deep and of shorter duration. He makes that argument, and interestingly, that's the argument that carries the day. Alan Greenspan goes up on Capitol Hill and says, kind of funny, Greenspan, he said, well, this won't hurt anything. <laughs> well, the Republicans say, see, this is great. And, but I realized then, that, well, they're all supply-siders now. All the Republicans and half the Democrats. And in, this is a funny thing because when Reagan starts talking about supply side economics in 1980 and introduces this poor guy with his poor hapless name, Arthur Laffer, the Laffer curve, and by the time the Democrats quit, quit laughing, it's law. Yeah. And Reagan had somehow gotten it through. Yeah. And George Herbert Walker Bush labeled it voodoo economics, of course, well, before he got yeah, on the ticket. Yeah, but now they're all supply siders in the Republican Party. In a way, what I guess the long story short, yeah, this yeah. is a Reagan legacy that Bush inherits okay, one. and never challenges, and it's it carries the day. Well, the the let's not bog this thing down with the uh, the dismal science, as economics is is called, but this is an echo of the Nixonian, we're all Keynesians now, mm -hmm. and of course, the argument of um, uh, that carries the day is an argument that was made by FDR and made by John F. Kennedy, uh, memorably, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, so under, under the, the polarities are supposed to be the economics of Keynes and the, and the economics of Gilder and Laffer and the supply side, but in a, in a recession, which we seem to be having now, even though some people don't want to call it that. In a in a two quarters of negative growth, and you never the problem with it is you never find out about it until afterwards. <laughs> is that is that 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 in a recession, the Keynesian prescription and the supply side prescription are identical. Mm -hmm. You're 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 cutting taxes. You're doing it for different reasons. The supply siders say you're cutting taxes because because it. Uh, People uh, produce better when they have more of their own income. The the the, the Keynesians say you got to get more money into the system, but it's a distinction without a difference. Because if you cut taxes, you cut taxes. Right. And 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 Bush really, uh, I think, made a. I think Bush made an honest Republican argument. Maybe the Democrats in the audience will find that a contradiction when he was arguing in in behalf of it during the campaign. But what he made was a Keynesian argument when he became president, 
and it was the right argument. Uh, it was the right argument. That doesn't mean you have to agree with every tax thing, because it, because well, the it, economy needed that. Right. And as a matter of fact, it produced results. It produced well, results in the economy. The, and the other, th the other things he said when he was running for president, he was going to cut taxes. He was going to get the Republicans in the game on education. And this was not... This was not Reagan. Was not Reagan. Reagan actually. wanted to eliminate the Department of Education. He actually never said that. Oh, he didn't? No, but he, he never said implied it. No, he... he, he, yeah, he the Department it. of Education, well... We all thought he was going to do it. be precise. This thing had always been there. We, we've written, what he's written, I've written uh, many times, you know, that Carter created the Department of Education as a trade promise to the national teachers, but that's not right. The Department of Education always existed. It's 100 years old. Carter elevated to cabinet status. Reagan was always much more careful in how he talked about that than the journalists talk about it, but he he was not enamored of it or of the idea that federal spending should even be spent on education. But anyway, times changed, and Bush was not, he was, a, he was not there on that. And he said, the third thing he said, and it's not a policy thing, but it's, he said he was going to restore civility to argumentation in Washington. He was going to work with both sides. And unite or not a divider seems like an awkward expression, but that's what he said. And the other half of it was restore dignity to the office. And so he would say this, and this was a thing with independent voters. If you liked Bill Clinton, you'd think, oh, good, he realizes impeachment was a mistake. If you didn't like Bill Clinton, you'd say, oh, good, okay, he's going to have sex with his own wife. That's yeah. a good thing. And so it was an argument. It was a state of kind of artful way of expl politics. Yeah, explaining that he was going to be different in this way. So those are the three things he said he was going to do. Yeah. And when he came in office, he, he started, he was on his way. No Child Left Behind was in conference committee. The Senate and the House of both passed bills. The tax cut was law. Uh, the Democrats... We're not quite beating Bush halfway on his rhetoric, but he was not he was speaking about them in very measured terms. And he seemed like a perfectly inoffensive one-term president yeah, right. uh, in well, the low it, 50s. And then 9-11 happened. Right. And then that's, that's, of course, where I'm going next. I mean, um, in the summer of 2001, it really did look like uh, the Senate had gone back to Democratic control. Um, he was struggling in the polls. Uh, even though all these things, these kind of early successes had happened. But the real difference between Reagan's presidency and Bush's presidency is that there was a, a, a very large war. Uh, There's a lot of differences. Bush wasn't shot in the war. Yeah, no, either. that's very good. That's a very good point. But I mean, it, it, it seems to me that... You didn't have the Soviet Union around either, you know. Yeah, no, no there are so many differences. And I don't want to do, do like the parallel show the whole time. But it seems like the war is what this president's going to be judged on by not only historians in the distant future, but by, by voters this year in some ways or, or in the very near future. Uh, a lot of people played this game early on. What would Ronald Reagan do? Would Ronald Reagan invade Iraq in the spring of 2003? I have no idea. But I'd love to hear what... We, we what, have especially an idea. What, yeah, we, have, we do. We yeah, you, an you have an idea. And, and, and then... I'll and then, start. You yeah, start. Yeah, right. and, yeah and, and then just to follow up, I mean... Um, don't, don't ask the follow-up okay, yet. Well, you go, you, you go ahead. You'll forget. Okay, well, you go ahead. You go ahead. We'll, we'll I'll interrupt you later. Answer and you'll forget the follow-up. Uh, I'm going to start. He's going to pick up. And we, we just we talk about this. And we give Fidel Castro like speeches on it. So please mm -hmm. cut in and interrupt. Him. <laughs> but uh, when we started this book, um, you know, he's the senior man, so you got to listen. But he said to me what I hoped he wouldn't say, which is, we're going to have to deal with Iraq in this book. I said, yeah, I realize that's true. And then he said something even more dismaying. He says, we need to know if Woodrow Wilson would have gone to Iraq. That's not as crazy as it sounds. No, no. Because uh, Bush was being criticized from the left and the right. This Woodrow Wilson thing was being, com he was being compared to Wilson. It's, well, used, yeah. it's used like a shillelagh to beat someone to their knees. It's not really something you're supposed to respond to. And, and Bush didn't, but we did. And so we decided, first of all, this great rhetoric, and so I'll be very, I'll be succinct, but and then I'll have my dad say, but because he, he he did this because I'm less succinct. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we first had to talk about the rhetoric, George W. Bush's rhetoric about freedom in the world, and we had to examine that. The he's been very harshly criticized in liberal elites for his rhetoric, but the rhetoric is not only, it's perfectly in line, not just with Reagan with Jack Kennedy and with Roosevelt, with the great Democratic presence and with Wilson, and that, that, that freedom, that America is more than just these United States and our, and our wealth, it's also an idea. Um, Reagan was so beautiful on this, he quotes John Winthrop, the 
in his in Reagan's on a hill. Reagan's farewell address, he talks about the city on the hill. And he says, "I never really said what I meant," and then he proceeds to say, "It's a shining city on a hill. If the if, the, if they had to, ha and anybody can get there who wants to be there, and it's freedom, and it's democracy, and it's activity. And if the if it has to have walls, the walls have doors. Anybody who can come can open those doors. It's one of the most beautiful." I wish Robin was here. It's one of those beautiful statements that American presidents ever made. Well, Bush talks this way too. When Bush says, when Bush says, Amer freedom is not America's gift to the world; it's God's gift to every man and woman in the world. Um, you know, my liberal Democratic friends always tell me, "Oh, this is terrible. He's got one foot in the New Testament, the other on a banana peel." But that's not right. He's got both feet planted firmly in the Declaration of Independence. That is natural rights. That's what our country's always believed in. And the great presidents have been as evocative about that, and Bush was. The question comes, how do you bring freedom to the world? And this is, and, and this is when this Wilson's famous thing, I'll make the world safe for democracy. This is the idea that, that you can go abroad and send fighting men and you can accomplish this goal. And this is blamed on Wilson. And Wilson is thought to be, by conservatives, to be naive about the League of Nations and by liberals to be too quick to send American troops. They both criticize Bush for being like Wilson. And so what we do in this book is, first of all, we examine whether Woodrow Wilson would have gone to Iraq. My dad writes this chapter, and I, if you read the book, I commit it to you. It's, a very, it's the best chapter in the book. It's a very original thing to have come up with. And uh, I'll give away the ending. No, Wilson would not have gone to Iraq. And then we take the Reagan example. And the whole book's about this, but I'll give you one thing. I'm stealing your story here. That's all right. Okay. Um, uh, my dad got a hold of these minutes. I, 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 you, I can filibuster on this thing, and you yeah. you can summarize it, so go ahead. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we, there were some notes of the, you know, Reagan wouldn't go to Panama. Do you remember this? Right. He was asked to go to Panama. George H.W. Bush did, and Noriega was opposed, and, you know, a few hundred people were killed, but Reagan wouldn't do it. The chiefs came to him, and then the just and finally Ed Meese and my dad got these minutes. Um, Jonathan mentioned Edmund Morris. He was given these documents. He didn't read them, but he read them. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point, Morris is too busy making stuff up. Yeah. At some point, Meese, uh, Ed Meese, the Attorney General, says, "Mr. President, law enforcement is for this," and Reagan says. Ed, that makes me think less of law enforcement. And Reagan is worried about how we'll be perceived in the Southern Hemisphere. With the, what's that phrase he always used? Colossus of the North. Colossus of the North. And, but that's a dramatic thing in our book, and I don't know if we told the story well or not. But, I, but that's the kind, when he turns to Meese and says this, there's no evidence that this president did that. There's no evidence that this president thought, wait a minute, and, you know, all right, we're going to invade Iraq, but what if it all goes badly? What, how will we be perceived in the Arab world? He must have had these thoughts, but there's no record of these kind of conversations. And the only thing we found ex at all of the top people, Cheney, Rumsfeld, even Colin Powell, is Powell going back and telling Larry Wilkerson, his aide, what if we do all this and we invade Iraq and we go and there's no weapons of mass destruction? It's the only time, I covered this White House, it's the only time that question even was asked aloud, and it was unimportant. Powell didn't say it to the president, he said it to his aide. And so we come to the conclusion that, that Bush, didn't, Bush spoke like Reagan, and like the other great presidents, and that he's not to be faulted for that, but that he didn't govern like him, and he didn't manage like them, and that he, he believed too much of what he wanted to believe, and he really was carried away by his own rhetoric. And, and, and so, our, yeah, our bottom line is that the rhetoric wasn't bad, it was great. It was maybe too good. Awesome. That's really, that's, I, I do think that's a crystallization of the central argument of the book. Two, 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 two small addendas, one about Wilson and the other about Ronald Reagan. Um, I don't know who cares about Woodrow Wilson anymore, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do. Uh, and uh, my wife said that uh, I've been wanting to write a defense of Woodrow Wilson all my life, and uh, she hasn't known me all my life, but she's right. Um, Woodrow Wilson did not. Uh, we start. I start that chapter by disputing the the the, the way Wilsonian is used in a way that Wilson himself would not recognize. 
Wilson had a brief imperialist adventure of the United States in, in, New, in Mexico, and he was burned by it. Mm -hmm. And he did not want to get into World War I. He, he resisted so much going into World War I that he was called a coward in Britain. He was elected on the slogan of, re-elected on the slogan of, he kept us out of war. Well, he meant to keep us out of war. And, and it was, it was the, the sinking of the Lusitania and other ships, the, the great terror weapon, terrorism, in, in the second decade of the 20th century was a submarine, because it stuck without warning and it killed women and children and civilians and innocents, um, and sometimes, sometimes only them. And, and, and uh, Wilson resisted in every way getting into this war. And he was tugged to get into the war. After the war, he refused to go into Armenia. He refused to do all sorts of, of things that, that have been done in, in Wilsonian, in, in, have Name given Wilson. the label of Wilsonian. He simply was not, Wilson, Wilson was not Wilsonian in the sense that the phrase is used. The second thing is, has to do about Ronald Reagan is, you talk about policy, you said it here, you write a book, you know, we think we're, or I said today in an interview, somebody said, you know, we think we're smarter than these guys. We're not smarter than, they're smarter than us. We don't have to make the decisions. We're not in the arena, like as, as Theodore Roosevelt said. R Ronald Reagan <laughs> took personally the life of every American serviceman who was lost. In it. He was devastated by Lebanon. Devastated, he said it was the saddest day of my presidency, the saddest day of my life, and 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 yes, he thought we should stay in Lebanon after we weren't in Lebanon to spread democracy in the Middle East, where there is a part of a multinational force, and we're very focused on America. Seventy French paratroops was a greater percentage of the French population than of our population were killed that same day as our Marines were killed, in in and and the the everybody got out of there. And we were out of there within two or three months. And Ronald Reagan insisted, the other side of this notion of that he wouldn't have gone into Iraq, is that we sort of argue that if he had gone into Iraq, he would have gone in there with a lot greater force. And he insisted that there'd be more tro troops involved in the little, in the little invasion of Grenada. Right. He, 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 he argued very strenuously in Panama. The only thing I want to add to Carl's comment on that is, in this day where you can say thank you or we're all Americans and be accused of plagiarism, George Schultz, George Schultz really explored that issue in his fine book. He explores it on about a page a thousand and something. And I, <laughs> I am a great admirer of George Schultz. Yeah. And I interview him every time I go to, to Stanford. And when I don't have any interview about I go by to pay my respects because I think he's one of the greatest of Americans. And I didn't have the guts to say what I'm going to say to you all now, <laughs> which is, which is, uh, George Shell said to me once in one of those interviews, he said, I, I mentioned the Panama thing, he said, you know, nobody ever paid, paid attention to that. And here's what I thought. I thought, well, Mr. Secretary, if you hadn't put this on page 1012, <laughs> you know, one of your reviewers might have read it and noticed it. But I didn't, I didn't say that. I just said, yes, I noticed that. But they didn't, nobody ever paid any attention to it. Well, on, on the subject of George Schultz, I want, uh, I want to talk about conservatism for a second, because um, this week we lost William F. Buckley, the intellectual godfather of, of conservatism. Um, I went back and read some old columns today. The guy wrote 5,600 columns, so I had to pick and choose. Um, he really turned on this war. The intellectual godfather of conservatism thought that the invasion and occupation of Iraq was the antithesis of conservatism, I think is how he put it in the column I read. Um, and yet the people that planned this war, I would, I would guess, I, I think, were, were more or less uh, conservative people. I'm not going to call them neoconservatives, but they're conservatives. What, um, what's the difference between the conservatism in foreign policy that you're describing, Lou and Carl, of, of Reagan, the idea I'm not going to, I'm not going to, have these adventures that I can't back up with large numbers of force. I'm not going to do this or that. What what was it that was not conservative about George W. Bush's foreign policy and especially the Iraq adventure? Let me start with William F. Buckley, and then I'll let the second part of that. Carl can do much better than I. Uh, to be against a war, or to be for a war, to put it your way, is not to be conservative necessarily. There's been a lot of conservatives who have been a lot of against against a lot of a lot of 
of uh, American wars. Uh, Holmes Alexander, who was a conservative icon as a columnist, was highly skeptical of the Korean War. The, uh, Bill Buckley's focus, and I should say that I really, uh, I had a real pang at his passing because when I was starting out as a reporter, writing my first book, I wasn't starting out as a reporter, but starting out as a book writer, I wrote letters to a whole bunch of, of, of famous people asking what they could tell me about Reagan or about the other guy I was writing about. And most of them didn't reply at all. And most of them sent forum letters. And Bill Buckley sent to this obscure young reporter at the San Jose Mercury News an introspective letter about Reagan. And he didn't know. Reagan was governor then. He didn't know whether Reagan would be a good president or not. He raised some questions about him. And I've always, and I always sort of uh, have this personal feeling about Bill Buckley because he bothered to answer a letter to me uh, uh, whom he did, didn't know at all and wouldn't have. Uh, but Buckley was always a thoughtful guy. He, you know, remember he debated Reagan on the Panama Canal Treaty. He thought we should assign the Panama Canal Treaty. Uh, he led the way in calling for the legalization of marijuana, uh, which was an outrage when National Review did it. Sure. He was skeptical of the Contras, uh, 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 although he later changed his view about them. Uh, he was not. Uh, Bill Buckley did not automatically think that going into war was was a conservative thing to do. He felt it was necessary to oppose the Soviet Union. He regarded the so we, we were the Third World War in the name of a famous column written for that National Review by James Burnham. And that was that was Ronald Reagan's focus. Uh, and one of the things that when we're comparing Reagan and we're comparing Bush or we're comparing anybody that we, we, we have to remember is that the context has totally changed because the context in which Reagan operated, and it's a context in which I argue he made his greatest contribution, was the context of the possibility of accidental nuclear war, which both he and Gorbachev were terrified. <coughs> Bush operates in a different context. <coughs> and since I need a glass of water here, why don't you, Dawn, why don't you speak to that? Well, Bush's conserva <coughs> excuse me, his conservatism <coughs> Is a more is a cultural conservatism. We we uh, I think we, we yeah we deal with this in the book. You the the old Republican Party um, that was centered in in the East, the bankers and the Rockefeller Party. This became a, a bad, this became a bad word to some of the Reaganites. But you can chart the evolution of the Republican Party through this one family, the Bushes. We do. And from Prescott Bush. From Prescott George Bush. W. Bush, yeah. Who's, who was very good, who was a good friend in the Senate of John F. Kennedy. He was a New England senator from Connecticut. Uh, pro, uh, he was on the board of Planned Parenthood, actually. <laughs> he was the treasurer of it, of the precursor organization. It had some birth control. Old Orwellian name, Kill All the Babies, Inc., or whatever. I'm, I'm making that That's up. That's not true. No, it isn't. <laughs> I'm being facetious. But, it was a, no, it was a, some kind of. Orwellian, yeah, it's in, I don't know, yeah, it's in the book. Anyway, but his son, George H.W. Bush, and he had other sons, but well, this family of these three men was, gave a, occasionally he and Barbara would send a small check to Planned Parenthood. He moved to Texas, he struck out on his own, he developed a taste for country music and pork rinds. I, those are perfectly legitimate tastes, and the, notwithstanding the wonderful insult of Molly Ivins, who once said that George H. W. Bush was not a legitimate Texan, and the proof was that he used the word summer as a verb and had little whales on his t little more blue ties with whales on them, yeah. that no Texan would ever do that. Well, I called her as a reporter. I called her up and I said, as a source, I said, Molly, I'm quoting you on the record. Is George W. Bush a Texan? And she, you know, left weighing hard bit and old broad, and she says. Yes, damn it. <laughs> yeah. And so, and Bush and his brother Jeb are never, ever on record, ever supporting abortion of any kind. In fact, one of the great footnotes of American history, Jebby is so adamant on this and so absolutist, he loses his first bid for the governorship of, of Florida. He's so mad, he's so so far to the right on this, he offends Floridians. Mm -hmm. And he loses narrowly to Lawton Childs, and then he runs again and, and, and wins. But by then, he's, 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 out, he's second in the queue in the Bush family to be president. Right. And so one of the reasons we get George W. Bush 
is because Lot and Child, because uh, Jeb was so adamant against abortion. So there, there's the evolution. And whatever your views, uh, your, your views on the life issues are, this is a change in the Republican Party and really a change in what it means to be a conservative. Yeah. And in some ways, in some ways, the, 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 the neoconservatives, as they're called, and the people around Bush and even Cheney, are not conservative with a small c because they have this great pro-Americana worldview that I, you can guess. I find it, I mean, it's attractive to me. I get it. It's appealing. But it doesn't take into account the central thing that Bill Buckley and Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan always had in mind, which is that the power of government is limited. And so these guys who don't trust government to pick up the trash and want to privatize prisons, suddenly they want to invade foreign countries and establish utopia. And there's something, dis it's, there's, there's a cognitive dissonance there in some ways, and that, I think that's being fought out in conservatism. And they haven't, you know, there's going to be a new generation of conservatives, and I don't know if they're going to be on this. Yeah, that's a big question. Yeah. Can, I, can I stay with this conservative Great, yeah. idea? Because it's, it's, it's something I, I think a lot about. The earlier, the generation of conservatives uh, that Ronald Reagan joined, he, he wasn't, he was a, you remember, he was a New Deal Democrat. The, but the generation he joined, which was the Goldwater generation, was, was conservative in a sense that I understood it growing up. Uh, you didn't want the government in the bedroom or the boardroom. Uh, Ronald Reagan in 1967 signed what was then the most permissive uh, uh, abortion rights bill in, in uh, as governor as passed by any state and at the time it, this is long before Roe v. Wade and all of us felt and I must say I felt then and I feel in retrospect that it would have been better had this decision been fought out in the states uh, rather than, than to have a national Fiat, which and made Lou, one. more Republicans in Sacramento support this law? Oh, well, the, that, that, that's the point. The yeah. Republicans were were far more supportive <coughs> of this <coughs> permissive abortion bill than were the Democrats. Uh, at that time, the <coughs> fault lines were almost entirely on religion. <coughs> there were more Roman Catholics. I'm a Catholic. There were more Catholics who were Democrats, <coughs> and the there were many more Democratic votes against this than there were Republican votes. In fact, the re when Ronald Reagan, who was been governor just three or four months, and he told me uh, in 68, it's the only time he ever told me this about anything, that he would not have signed that bill if he'd have been governor a year later, and I, and I absolutely believe him. But Ronald Reagan was beginning to have second thoughts about it and waffle on it, and the Republican legislators forced him to bring it up for a vote, forced him to pass it, one of the smartest Republicans in the Senate. He was a guy named Donald Grunsky, and he was a lawyer and a good, good, really smart guy. And his argument for bringing up the abortion bill and getting it passed is, uh, let's get this issue behind us. <laughs> wow. It was going to be an issue that would go, go away. Be done. But the Republic, there, there was absolutely no, re Goldwater, to use the present language, Goldwater's pro-choice, Simpson's pro-choice, Barry Goldwater, you know, all these people, all these Republicans, my friend Paul Laxall, who was Catholic, was was against it. But the breakdown was 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 always on on religion, and it was not the focus. And if you look at the Goldwater Legislative Party, as Mickey Andrews has said, this party was fighting against Lyndon Johnson's uh, what they thought authoritarian use of the presidency. It was a legislative party. It didn't. It 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 distrusted executive power. One of the ironies of the of the of the George W. Bush administration, and we touch on this, we don't go this in the book perhaps as much as we should, is that, that George W. Bush, by asserting this, he's asserting this nationalism, asserting the right of the president to do anything he wants. He's really asserting things that FDR asserted, that LBJ asserted. He's not really asserting, in, in if you take the Goldwater view of things, or the early Ronald Reagan view of things, he's not asserting, in my view, what are our conservative values. But I absolutely agree with, with my son Carl here, as I do on so many things. I think that conservatives are not quite at a dead end, but they're in a quandary. And, and, and I think, as David Brooks and others have written, conservatives have sort of run out of ideas. You know, Obama was on to something, uh, although he got sort of hell for it in his own party. Obama says, 
uh, well, the Republicans and Ronald Reagan were the party of ideas, and you know, uh, and it was Bill Clinton that got well, in the game. Well, yeah. but, but 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 what it, what what it had to commend it is that Barack Obama was exactly right. I agree. But the other side of it is he was also suggesting that conservatives are no longer no longer the font of these ideas, and he's right in that too. And 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 conservatives conservatives need to need to rethink yeah. their values. That gives me a pretty good segue because I want to get to your questions in a second. But um, Carl mentioned, you know, on the campaign trail, candidate Governor George W. Bush says, I want to be united on a divider, probably one of the more famous phrases he uttered. Um, I want to contrast, come back to the contrasting between Reagan and even Bush pair, Bush 41, with the current president, in the way they dealt with members of the opposing party. And my, my favorite exhibit in this institute is, is the Social Security uh, fix that, that President Reagan uh, inaugurated in, in, his, in his first term. Um, he also um, courted Democrats just with a plum. You're talking about Reagan? Yeah, Reagan. Really courted the Democratic Party on his tax-cutting budget bill, kept his word not to campaign against Democrats who supported it. I just don't see the same story uh, for the 43rd president. Well, let, well all right. Let's let put in a word for Bush here. He tends to get beat up even all the time, even like my dad said, even when people agree with him. In, in, in uh, 1999, a congressman in George Miller, who you may or might may not Bay Area. know, he's from California, my dad knows him, my dad knew his dad, uh, he also, his father was in politics, went to Austin, Texas and paid his respects to Bush, and he said, I'm here because you used a phrase, and the phrase was, disaggregate the data. Isn't that a fascinating, what's he talking about? He's talking about this. He's talking about achievement gaps between Latino and black children and Anglo children and disaggregate the data in the context of education policy jargon, and only a governor would know the phrase, means you're going to judge everybody. You're not going to say these blacks are doing good for blacks. He's saying, we've got to educate these kids. It was, a, it was one of the most, can I use the word progressive or decent, insightful thing a Republican had said in many years. And Miller went down there and he said, if you do this as president, I'm with you. And George Miller and Ted Kennedy carried the No Child Left Behind bill. And this thing was, it, it's like, you know, poor Hillary and Barack are having to, having to denounce NAFTA. It's the singular achievement of Clinton's presidency, so it must be pretty hard for Hillary. No, Clinton. Oh, sorry, yeah. But, but, uh, but, you know, you gotta, it's primary season. Oh, now. You gotta do this. Well, well the No Child Left Behind, they've gotta say bad things about it. But actually, this is, this is both parties coming together. Think past the Senate, like, you know, 90 votes. Yeah. Something, the only people who vote against are a few Republicans. This is to get, this is to, for this country to finally say, 50 years after Brown Board, Board of Education, 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, black children, if they go to public school, they ought to be taught as well as white children. Bush does this. Kennedy's with him. A year later, I'm on the dais at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and Bush turns to me. This doesn't happen every day where the president asks you something, so you tend to remember it. He said, what happened to Ted Kennedy? We do put this in the book. And, and Kennedy had given a, a kind of an intemperate interview about this war being cooked up in Austin for political purposes. Very nearly the opposite of the truth. I mean, you can think the war is really dumb, but it never figured to help Bush politically. And he knew it. I mean, if he's wrong, he's just wrong. He's not nefarious and wrong on this. And Kennedy deep down knows that. But Kennedy was frustrated, and he said these things. And Bush is asking me, what about... What happened to Ted Kennedy? And I don't give a president advice, but in this case, I said, Mr. President, you went to war. He was strongly against it. That divides families in this country. It's certainly going to divide the most liberal guy in the Senate and a conservative Republican president. And I think Bush came, I think without 9-11 and without, you know, if Bush doesn't go to Iraq, we're talking about a different kind of president. Absolutely. He worked with Democrats in Austin. He was doing it in Washington. He stopped doing it. Yeah. And I, he stopped doing it, and we, we talk about this in the book, too. I think he stopped doing it for, for a reason. It's a, it's a secondary reason to the war. His popularity was so high, he thought he didn't have to do it anymore. And I... This is a chapter we both, we pass back and forth, but we are at one mind, my father and I. He misunderstood the nature of that 79% job approval rating. He had Eisenhower numbers a lot longer than Ike, longer than Reagan. And what happened was is that Americans rallied around 
the president the way they do. It's our way of rallying around ourselves. And that's the time he most needed to start asking the Democrats. Okay, that's great. And he, it's the time he thought he least needed to ask them, I, I think, is the answer. It's a different answer than I was expecting, but I, yeah. Really. Well, the, the, the point about, uh, Jonathan, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be critical of you, but you do something that's quite different than anybody who interviews us. You've actually read the book, ha. so 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 so. You know my secret. So, so it's uh, uh, you. We just, have to you have to respond. Yeah. To the, you know, usually somebody you get these questions. Well, what do you think of Ronald Reagan after you've just written, you know, two okay. thousand words about him? What do you say? Anyway, I just want to say one point on that. I totally agree across it, but this is a different point. That, but it relates to your question is. We argue that Ronald Reagan was a success as a president, both because he was conservative and despite the fact that he was conservative. Ronald Reagan never, ever, ever let anything stand in the way of success. If the choice was following uh, 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 the uh, third uh, item in the conservative creed versus getting the bill passed, Ronald Reagan went for getting the bill passed every single time. I mean, he would say in California, and he uh, that uh, when some of the arch conservatives voted against his budget thing, the, the trouble with them is they want to go off the cliffs with uh, all flags flying. He says, "I," uh, he says, "I want to get some this year, and then we don't get it all. We'll come back next year." That's what our liberal friends have been doing for years. Ronald Reagan on Social Security was—it's it, really the most vivid contrast. If you, uh, if Carl wants to, you can talk about the privatization, the busted uh, uh, thing about the break that Bush tried in 2005, which we write about. But I just want to talk for a minute, not about that, but about what Reagan did. Reagan actually was much more for privatization of Social Security in his heart of hearts than George W. Bush ever was. But Ronald Reagan absolutely, in fact, Ronald Reagan was kept off the, the, the Goldwater's aides wanted to uh, uh, keep him off the platform speaking for Goldwater because they thought he was too controversial on on Social Security. Now here's the guy, a candidate, Goldwater, who said, let's lob one in the men's room of the Kremlin. And it managed to scare half Nuclear the people in Obama. <laughs> yeah, knew half the people in America. And the Re Goldwater's people thought Reagan was too controversial. But Reagan told me, I quote him in the very first book, he says, well, we can't talk about Social Security, he said. Barry proved that. But Ronald Reagan, what in his heart, Ronald Reagan thought Social Security, he, he'd go through this long-winded stuff about how we didn't invest enough in it and how what to look at the slow return. And he tried in the first year of his presidency, they tried a couple of little end runs around Social Security. They got slapped down. The Republicans were so embarrassed, they repudiated it by unanimous votes. So what did Ronald Reagan do next? Next, he appoints a commission headed by Alan Greenspan. He works closely with Tip O'Neill. Uh, he puts Jam Jim Baker inquired about the, uh, as they say, the vice president's job is to inquire solitiously on the health of the president. Jim Baker inquired every week solitiously on the health of that commission. And what does that commission do? It comes back with a compromise. It advances the age of Social Security, which the Democrats didn't want to do. It, it does some things that the many years in the Republicans future. Don't, don't want to do. It, 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 it. Carl is very good in quoting Carl Rove about how, how contemptuous, contemptuous the Bush people were of this. It was just, oh, it was just incremental change. This incremental change made Social Security solvent for an entire generation. And it was signed off, and then Tip and, and Reagan are in the Rose Garden hugging each other. You couldn't stand it. It, it wanted to make you go out and throw up if you knew what they really thought about this. But, but the truth was it was a terrific, terrific achievement. It was a terrific political achievement. And Ronald Reagan was a practical person. And Ronald Reagan did not let, let, let ideology get in the way of success. That I humbly submit is what we want of our of our politicians. Sounds pretty good. Well, what Rose, Rose said to me in an interview for this book, which he boasted about how he wasn't going to let Bush talk to us for this book. When I asked him why, he said he thought it was unfair to compare someone to Reagan. It was like comparing somebody to Roosevelt. I, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but I sat there and I thought, because he hadn't given me anything, I thought, well, that's a quote I can use. And I didn't act like I was happy. I had the tape recorder running. I said, okay. 
I mean, you know, they don't think they should be compared to Reagan. Well, they had been comparing themselves to Reagan right up until that interview. But, but, uh, but what Carl Rose said to me was, in a sense, dismaying if you're a good government person. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. He said, this wasn't a permanent fix. This wasn't a, this was a temporary thing. He may have even used the word incremental. I think, I think he did. But, but if you think about it, in his State of the Union address in 2005, George W. Bush had said, He'd walked you through the, the, the actual, I don't know if you remember it, the oh, yeah. actuarial tables. So it's math. He's right. The system isn't sustainable on current projections. And in 2013, it all hits the fan. Now think of this. The, Reg the Greenspan Commission was 1983. So that means this incremental fix had fixed the, most, the biggest government program for 30 years. And they didn't think that was sufficient. I submit to you, that's not very conservative world view. And they wanted to fix it for all time. They had some radical, grandiose notion. And I, I think Karl Rove badly served Bush on this. I think you, 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 come up, you can come up with a sol solution that lasts 30 years to fix the program. You take it. The other thing about that, by the way, that I thought was problematic for the president was there were troops in the field. I, I had this, I had my a mythical person in I wish I could say Lawrence, Kansas, but I was actually thinking Hayes, Kansas. I don't know why. Who was watching the television, thinking, leaning forward and saying, oh, you know, watching Bush's speech and walking through the numbers, and then he gets to the punchline. The punchline is 2013. This is, we're going to have to fix this. And he turns to his wife, this guy, and says, who's got a nephew in Iraq, and this guy works down the feedlot with as a, as a son in Afghanistan, and he says, we have troops in the field. Why are we even talking about this? And that was not very good. Um, I want to leave time for your questions. We have two interns in the back, correct, with handheld mics. If you have a question for either canon, please raise your hand and we'll get you a mic as soon as possible. Surely there are some. Way up here in the front, Mark. Without reference to the current uh, political scene, but from your knowledge of past presidencies, if you had your choice, would you choose a visionary or would you choose a practical politician? Um. The, sh the, sh the short answer to that is that those are not mutually exclusive traits. Reagan was thought to be a visionary. And that's the surprising part of this book, other than finding out that at 50 years of age I could still learn from the old man about writing, it was how practical Ronald Reagan was. And so if your heart, if you're, you said don't reference the campaign, but let's just if your heart tells you Obama and your head tells you McCain, that's an interesting, I don't mean you particular, but that's, that's, what's, that's what we're going, perhaps facing. That's an interesting thing because actually Barack Obama is very bright. He's this Harvard lawyer. He's always been a star, an intellectual star. And John McCain is this war hero who gets your heartstrings. So really I think I'm looking for both of those things myself, and I don't think you can find them in one person. My answer would be that um, you want a president, if we can't see around corners, you want him as uh, Walter Lippmann once said of De Gaulle, you want somebody who can see across the room. Mm -hmm. So you want somebody who, who, uh, who, uh, uh, is not just tactical, to my view, to get this out of the clouds. Uh, um, uh, I was and remain critical of President Clinton because I thought he was a very highly tactical president and, 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 and some of his tactics I agreed with and others I didn't and some of his goals likewise. But it didn't seem to me that he had, um, to use Bill Buckley's uh, praise from that long ago letter to me uh, about Reagan, an, in, an enduring perspective. Uh, we've had a lot of presidents who do have an enduring perspective uh, in my lifetime. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, 
um, Truman, Eisenhower, in some ways, in respects to Johnson, although he was undone by the war, um, Ronald Reagan. And I, I, I think that, that, that what I was talking about being practical wasn't in your view of, 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 of government or where we're going. Ronald Reagan gave these long rhetorical expositions and talked about America in this classic way as a city on a hill. I was talking about governance. When the quest came to governance, you have to make you have to make practical d decisions. That's where I do think that, that that Rove and Bush following him went wrong in 2005. I think they would have been better to invest the popularity they had then in tax reform than in privatization of Social Security, which really nobody wanted, uh, you know, deep deep down. So it's it's really it's really hard to to make those that choice because. You want a visionary, but I guess what you want is a, is a visionary who's practical in office. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Mr. Edlin up here has one. A question of comparison. Ronald Reagan always seemed to me to be a man who was speaking from heartfelt philosophy, whereas George W. Bush, in his inarticulate way, seems to be a man who is speaking what he's heard from someone else. Is that a fair characterization? Well, it, it was said of Reagan at the time. Well, endless criticism from the left about how he was a puppet and other people were pulling his strings and he couldn't, and, he, and, and we, we're all guilty of this, but, but uh, a lot of the people who extol, the liberals who extol Reagan now in our, we quote some in our book, some of our friends, to criticize Bush. They had nothing good to say about Reagan at the time. But, and you don't always know who, whose words they were, but in that speech, I, I, that shining city on the hill speech, the Reagan farewell address, there's a, there's a subtle little dig in it against his own speechwriter, Peggy Noonan, who was going around taking credit for that line. And Reagan says, it's a, nobody remarked on it at the time, even the greatest Reaganologist in the world. But Reagan prefaced it by saying, I've been using this phrase all my adult life. Well, that means Peggy Noonan was in short pants, so it wasn't her. And of course, the line, Kennedy used to quote it all the time because it's from John Winthrop. And John Winthrop. 1630. And John Winthrop, well, he's quoting the New Testament. And John, this, yeah. he doesn't say shining seat on the hill, but he says, you'll be a beacon, you'll be a city. And he's, Winthrop is talking about, to the Puritans, it's a sermon he writes on the boat before he's ever seen America. He's not only saying what America is, but how we're going to present ourselves to the rest of the world before we're a country before he's landed. And to but Reagan, what this meant, what it means to me, is that America was more than an idea. Excuse me, that America was more than a place, that it's an idea. I actually think Bush gets that at his core. I, I don't think... There's anybody there telling Bush, Bush is a prickly guy. He doesn't like being interrupted. He has a cell phone. I wish I could show you this cell phone. I th yeah, I have. It's the same daggum thing. It's a talisman. I can't get rid of it. My kids laugh at me. This is so last year. It's so last decade. It's so last century. It's got no camera. It's got no antenna, in fact. And the reason it's so beat up is that it went off while I was asking Bush a question on the ranch. And I... I thought, oh, i turn it off, and I kept turning it louder and louder because it was new, and I didn't know how it worked. And finally, in exasperation, I threw it over my shoulder, and it landed in a cow patty. And it's never been, it the, it's never been the same. Bush, but Bush laughed, but, his, but he, boy, he must have dressed down his aides. They mentioned it to me for months. But anyway, and he didn't laugh because it went off. He laughed because it landed in the cow patty. He thought that was fitting. These guys can't tell Bush to say anything. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to criticize this guy, and the gap between his set pieces, those great state of unions that Mike Gerson writes, and his off-the-cuff remarks can be startling. But, but this is Bush, and in a way, you know, Bush's critics take him off the hook in a way. You know, the first thing, he's stupid. Remember that? That was the first argument. Well, he's an idiot. Well, all right. I didn't go to Yale and Harvard, so I will not call him an idiot. Then it's, well, he's evil. Well, okay, then if he's evil, all right, well, 
How, what do you, that's a conversation stop. Well, they should have invaded Iraq because that's an evil thing. I mean, <laughs> it was, so what? But I, if you take him at face value, and you say he, this, these are his words, and he believes this, and I think that's what we do in this book, then then you judge him by his results. I guess that's what I do. So I mean, I'm not. I, I don't really know what's in his heart. You know, you can't. But I, I've, I've I've been around him, and I think you couldn't get this guy to say anything he didn't want to say. And the closest thing I saw to it was that gay marriage deal. Remember that? When he comes out against gay marriage in the campaign? Oh, he didn't like that. Yeah, I was there. He was physically uncomfortable. It was the only time I ever saw him. Hmm. He, 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 looked, he looked unhappy. He knew he had to do it. And, you know, he, Kerry did the same thing. And we knew, Kerry, we knew Kerry's views because he, he was on record as supporting gay marriage in Massachusetts. And he had felt he had to do the same thing. I called Carl Rove up and I said, hey, congratulations. Um, you've taken the, the candidate. The, the one great thing Bush had is comfortable on his skin, and now you've made him look uncomfortable and like a bigot to boot. Boy, Rove gave me an earful for that. I probably went a little too far. But I, that's not my criticism of Bush, that, he, that he's being told what to do. The question, though, is did Dick Cheney have too much influence in this White House? And I think that's what you're getting to, and that's a good one. Can I filibuster a little longer? Sure. I, I'm I'm taking we, my little evening snooze. Okay. <laughs> we, we had this we had this chapter in the NBA president. You know, here's the guy. He's the NBA from Harvard, and he he patterned himself. And I won't give you the whole chapter, but he's he's going to be Peter Drucker. You know, he's going to be the guy who delegates and hold, makes clear goals, delegates, hires good people, supports him. Um, we are. I argue in the, that chapter that our publisher wanted to take out of the book, but we fought for it. He didn't, he didn't even do it. He didn't follow Drucker. But there was an interesting thing. We, we left it in after we rewrote it. You know, we thought. Okay. <laughs> um, but leaving Drucker aside, this thing about Cheney having all this power was a management, as a management thing, it didn't work. We went to see Cheney in 2003. We had lunch with him. And I was doing a piece for... National Journal on the Vice Presidency and evolution of it. Cheney knew this. My dad was going to do a story for the New York Times Sunday Magazine about Cheney himself that, that the Bush White House and its infinite wisdom decided not to cooperate with at the last minute. Uh, so that piece never ran. But I said to Cheney that when Truman became president, he'd only met with Roosevelt a couple of times alone. That he didn't know he didn't know what Stalin had been promised at Yalta. He didn't know much about the atom bomb. He didn't know any of the things you'd need to know to be president. But Cheney knew about this. And I said, how many times have you met with him alone? And he reaches in his his pocket like this, kind of showy. He has a paper like this. And he, reaches in, he pulls it out and he says, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times today. Today. Yeah. And boy, we, we all thought that was great, man. We, David Broder and me and him and everyone, well, this is good government. And Cheney went on and explained it. I'm only serving this guy. I'm not going to run for office. He knows it. Everybody in this town knows it. I don't have to deal with some chairman from Colorado who wants to make money or some Republican, you know, functionary in Iowa. I'm just here to do the guys, to do for him. Like I say, everybody, David Broder wrote a column about it. We did, I did. Everybody thought that made sense. It actually doesn't make sense. Now we know. This is the beauty of this, what we do. You know, you think about these things. Here's why it didn't make sense. Two reasons. The first thing is, if Cheney is, if, if he's really the super, an uber chief of staff, which is what he was, well, that's problematic because then, first of all, what's Andy Card? He's a deputy chief of staff, or something less. And so when Andy Carton goes to Bush and says, <clears throat> you got to get rid of Rumsfeld, which he did, it's not really the chief of staff talking. And the second problem is, the vice president is a constitutional officer. So Cheney, Bush can't really fire him. So you have this problem, very basic problem of management. If Cheney's the CEO, what's Bush? Who's the chairman of the board? I submit to you that the president can't be the chairman of the board. And the other problem with it is that 
if the, the vice president running for office, guess what? If you'd have been on that phone with that Colorado chairman or that Iowa political hack, they'd have said, hey, you know what? We're not real big on this Iraq thing. And it turns out that the vice presidency has another political role that very little understood. It's understood now. H having that guy want to succeed you is another check and balance within your own party and within the country, and you have to know what the grassroots is thinking. So if that was, if you were getting to that, that's and on top of all that, he selected himself. <laughs> Most mind filling thing I've ever well, seen in my life. Well, uh, well, that's not quite how it went. Okay. But, but you know, no, no, Bush, Bush wanted him all along. Okay. Bush okay. wanted him. You, you, you might know that more. Here, than here, that. Here's, yeah. my, here's our argument in the book. Yeah. Uh, but I want to say to the gentleman who asked the question um, you know, you, if you write long enough and cover things long enough, you realize how little you know. Every year sort of subtracts from my knowledge. And I know less than I did when I started out. <laughs> and one of the things I don't understand, maybe. Hedrick Hertzberg, once reviewing a book of mine, a New Yorker, praising it, his only criticism of me was that I don't, that I'm not ideological enough, and that may be the problem because I don't understand, and I understand less than I used to, why people who disagree with, uh, a, I understand partisanship, I think partisanship is really important, I don't understand why they want to denigrate the, the default position of Republicans about a Democrat is he's a liberal, he, as if that didn't call, cover a multitude of sins. The default position of, 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 of Democrats wanting to put down a Republican is that he's stupid. Eisenhower was stupid. Reagan was stupid. Ford was stupid. You know, they, at least they didn't say that. Nixon can say one thing. Nobody said he ever said he was stupid. No. And, 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 uh, and, and now Bush is. And I think that that's, say that is stupid. <laughs> uh, I, I really think that that, 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 that that is a kind of denigration and I don't know why anybody would want to denigrate. I, uh, Carl knows him. I don't. I knew Reagan very well. I don't know George W. Bush at all. I've met him a few times, thanks to Carl. But but I don't think there's any doubt about his authenticity as a human being. Or as a. But I think there's a lot of doubts about the way he governs. And 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 I think that if you give him his bona fides, if you if you if you accept that he is authentic, that he means what he says. Uh, then the criticisms of him amount to a hell of a lot more and are, are, are more important. Uh, on the Cheney thing, I knew Cheney quite well. He was the uh, White House Chief of Staff for Ford. I covered the Ford presidency. Uh, Dick and I were quite close. I thought he was uh, 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 really a great Chief of Staff. And uh, that's generally the verdict of people who knew him then. I think that that Bush made a, a constitutional mistake and a political mistake, not in picking Cheney, but in picking him the second time. And if you, we do sort of argue this in the book, and Carl has some good language on it uh, uh, in the book, but one of the things that our system does, it, 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 it keeps the vice president unimportant, which he should be, so he's never a rival center of power for the president. But it's also, it gives him a great visibility. This is the first election since uh, 1952 uh, uh, in which there is no one running for president. There's nobody who has been a vice president or a vice presidential candidate or president. And, you know, so we're, 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 really, we're really starting anew. And all these people who, you know, uh, Bush or Dole or Gore, they, or Mondale, everybody, you know, wants to be, they run for president. That's what they should do. And Cheney, by picking Cheney, who was disqualified for health re and other reasons, but mostly for health reasons, from becoming president, the Bush administration shut itself off from the future. It said effectively, here, this, uh, here we are and here we go and no further. You know, uh, and it wasn't like uh, Luther nailing those theses to the to the wall either. It, it's it's a it's a it's a it was a qu question. They weren't interested in what the guy out in I think Carl says what the Kansas ca chairman in Kansas thought about the war or what they weren't 
They weren't looking to the future. This whole, the other side of this Panama debate, which we examined, is that I think Reagan was absolutely right, but Reagan lost the argument. They, uh, uh, George W. Bush, his, George H. W. Bush wants to go in after Noriega. Why? Because George H. W. Bush is running for president in the United States and he doesn't want anybody to say he's weak. And, and so, and so, uh, you know, all these people are clamoring against Reagan. And even if that, debate sort of argues against the general proposition, at least they were talking about the next presidency. These guys have not been talking about the next presidency for four years. They haven't been talking about the future for four years, and that's why they're the past. And one of the reasons for that is they didn't have a vice president who was eligible. Now, Dick Cheney has, has his faults, as we all do, but, but Dick Cheney is loyal. And George... Now, I don't blame Cheney for this. I blame, I blame President Bush. Had President Bush said, I want to put somebody else in there, you pick, you know, Governor Pawlenty or mm -hmm. Sanford or you know, Charlie Crist wouldn't have been around at the time, but somebody, anybody, uh, Cheney would have dutifully stepped aside and supported him. And, 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 he, could have, and he, could have had a, he could have had a say in the next presidency. But there's that that's, Bush loyalty gene, too. That's the loyalty gene. Yeah. Um, I want to leave time, plenty of time for you guys to buy this wonderful book and for the canons to sign it in the back around the corner. So I think we have time for one more question. Scotty has one up here. Or do you have one already picked out? We can do both of these. Can do both. Okay, two. fair enough. Two more we'll, 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 be, we'll answer this more briefly. Here and then, Scotty. How does a conservative deal with this misbegotten idea of the war on terror? which to me seems, you know, an issue of intelligence gathering, of alliances, uh, of international trust, uh, and certainly not war on the one hand. And what does a conservative think of this intelligence gathering, police work type of uh, approach to a war on terror? I'll give Thank a you. very brief answer, and then let Carl, because I don't do the heavy lifting on it. Here's my problem with the war on terror. Uh, in every war that we've been engaged, we have uh, sort of set civil liberties aside. Uh, there was a Truman aide who talked about setting aside the Constitution in order to preserve it. Uh, uh, Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus is well known. Uh, while I defend Wilson on getting into war, Wilson's administration is indefensible in what it did to uh, radicals during and after that war. But the problem is, the problem is that with the war on terror, if the war is truly an unending war, if this war is going to be with us forever and with every president forever, then it seems to me you, you, you have a real problem with, with suspension of civil liberties or anything else because when does it end? I mean, what, I mean we knew there was an end time to use a, 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 a religious uh, of phraseology. We knew there was an end time to World War II and to the Vietnam War and the Korean War. We don't really know whether there's an end time to this war and the war on terrorism we're talking about, not the war in Iraq. So I, all of that too. So I don't, that's what gives me pause. I don't have a great answer to it. Well, I'll just add one thought. The, when this book that Jonathan mentioned, I wrote, The Pursuit of Happiness in Times of War, um, one of the people who blurbed it was the um, was Dick Hofstetler. It was Not the, bad. Was the last one he blurbed. He he, he died. At, at, he was still vibrant at 83. Had a fall and had complications. But before he was one of these guys. He he wanted to read the book. He wouldn't just blurb it because he liked you. And he made comments. And one of the comments he made, he thought that Bush would re come to regret using that that formulation, war on terror, and that. And he certainly thought that Iraq was a mistake. And he said, he, he told me that I had, to, I had to say something about Iraq. And I'm a reporter. I don't usually declare myself. But I, I, I at the end of the book, then explain my skepticism for it. But I, I'm a little bit sympathetic to Bush on that awkward phrase. Because terror is a tactic. It's not an enemy. It's not like a war on Nazi Germany. They don't quite know what to say. They don't want to say a war on Islamic, on Islamic radicalism. They don't quite know what to say. But it's their view was that Bush's view and Rumsfeld's and Cheney's was that not only Bill Clinton, sort of ignore, who ignored Al Qaeda, but Ronald Reagan, 
had made this problem worse by not confronting it and by not seeing it as a worldwide war. We meant, uh, my dad mentioned Lebanon. <clears throat> they believe that the way we withdrew from Lebanon and, and Somalia and these other places encouraged Osama bin Laden to see us as weak. And Osama bin Laden says that. So their view is that this had to be confronted in, in harsh language and with force and to be treated as a war in order to, to, to show America's enemies that we were serious. I don't know if that was the right thing to do or not. I know that's what they were thinking. It doesn't seem very conservative, but it, it may have been military effective. We, we had a dinner earlier and my dad was talking about Doug Brinkley who said, very, a historian, very critical of Bush, says he's the worst president ever. But he said, you know, one, raise, one way that Bush could be considered in the future a better president than we consider him now is, is that there's no more attacks. Um, at this CPAC conference we were at, we got trapped up on the dais. Cheney gave this fiery speech. We were there. Everybody's applauding. We're not applauding. We're not trying to, we're not trying to pretend we're not even there. We don't want to scowl either. We just want to not be there. So we're, we did our potted plant imitation. But Cheney said something interesting. He said that there haven't been any more attacks. He said, this is not an accident, it's an achievement. I'd never heard him say it so going that way. bluntly as he'd said it. And I thought to myself, well, that's an idea I'm going to have to try on. Is that right? And if it's true, what have we paid for it? And I, I think that's what we'll be sorting out for many years to come. Now, there's a lady here who had a question. Yeah. I just didn't want to let her get yes. shut out. And then we'll... Scotty up in the second row. Thanks. It we can all hear you better. It would seem to me that it's very difficult to govern America anymore. Uh, we are so diverse that it makes it difficult, and I think we're conflicted that a uh, great many of us say we do not want a president that governs by polls. And when we get one that doesn't, we're very unhappy. <laughs> Don't you think it's very, very difficult now to govern in America? I think it's extraordinarily difficult, uh, and uh, uh, in my dotage here, I've become even become I've become uh, sympathetic to presidents uh, more so than I ever was when I was writing about them on a regular basis. But I think what makes it difficult is 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 not just the complexity of the world and and uh, and the partisanship, but that as a country we have been for the last decade and a half, you can argue how long it's been, but it's but for a considerable period of time now, we've been very evenly divided. Uh, there's there's a guy, a political scientist at, at Stanford, and we both know him, named uh, 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 Fiorina, who argues that, that the country isn't as polarized as the politicians are. I don't know whether that's true or not, but but I think it's very difficult for a president to forge a successful coalition in a in a 50-50 country, and uh, without putting in any word for him, because I've not uh, decided on this election myself, but I think Barack Obama has at least thought about this. And if you look at the Obama rhetoric about the Republicans and you know, and and it's a little bit remi reminiscent of Bush's, isn't it? About a uniter instead of a divider. Is that although he's not using that phrase, is is that he's at least dealing with the problem that in order to govern successfully in in this country, which is as closely divided as we are, we have to figure a way to build coalitions that are not 51 to 49, and we have to do that in part because the Senate you, you need to get you need to get 60 votes. But you have to do it, I think, in a larger sense because the country, uh, uh, the country needs to feel that they've got a president who is, uh, in the old phrase, president of all the people. And no, it's not going to be easy. I just add one sentence to that to paraphrase another candidate who's running for high office this time. Um, this polarization is re is real in in politics, and I, it's going to take a president <laughs> to to fix it. And both John McCain and Barack Obama seem to understand that. Um, Hillary Clinton's running a different kind of campaign right now, but I suspect she does too. 
but how you do it is not easy. Bill Clinton did a poll on where he should go on vacation. Martha's Vineyard or, Mon or Wyoming. The public told, chose Wyoming. That was the wrong decision. He didn't know what to do there. He doesn't fish. He doesn't ski. He was bored out of his mind. He really needed to be at Martha's Vineyard. And the Bush people made a lot of fun of this, but the, they're the other extreme. 22% uh, say Iraq's a good thing. Well, screw them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> somewhere between those two extremes, and you're right. And, and Ken Duberstein, who was chief of staff for Reagan, so he's not a neutral person, but he argued that you've got to have the people with you to do big things, and, and ignoring them means you can't do big things. And Ronald Reagan didn't take any polls, but Ronald Reagan knew that. Yeah, well, he had a good sense of that. Let me thank our first father-son tandem to the Dole Institute. Bravo.